one of our lectures. This is the second to last of our fall lecture series, so thanks for coming. Um, tonight we have a very unique presentation by one of our own. Um, tonight, David Daly, our museum care curator, is going to be sharing with you some of the research that he's been doing to the side of his everyday duties as well. Um, David's been working here at the Longfellow House for over a decade. Um, is a huge asset and resource, especially for people like me who are starting off. I go to many questions constantly. And besides an extensive knowledge of the stuff in the house, all the objects and the collections, he also knows the Longfellow family almost personally. Um, and he's taken a particular interest in one of the sons of the poet. His name is Charlie. They traveled all over the world. Um, if you were here about a year ago, David did another talk about Charlie's travels in India, hiking in the Himalayan mountains. He's worked to transcribe some of those journals. So the topic tonight stems from that interest. Tonight it is about the yacht Alice, which is a yacht that was owned by an uncle in the family. Um, and David will share some of his discoveries um, and some of the seafaring ad adventures that this yacht partook in. So, without further ado, here you David. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh -huh. Very nice. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is a really nice crowd for a November evening. And I just want to preface this before I start by saying I am not a sailor myself. So if I stumble and call the stern the back of the boat, don't crucify me. Um, the terminology is uh, just dizzying in its array of sails and equipment on, on uh, ships and sailing. So it's uh, tough to get your, your head around. Um, well, let's just start off. Uh, so tonight I am going to talk about a boat, as Anne mentioned, uh, a yacht that was owned by two members of the extended Longfellow family, and that is the Yacht Alice. And why am I talking about a boat today? Uh, well, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the Alice's 1866 record-setting voyage from Massachusetts to England, so it seemed like a proper time to take a look back at that trip. I'll talk a little bit about the boat itself, of course, its construction, its characteristics, and also a lot about the people involved, because I think that's always one of the most interesting aspects of any story, or the people who uh, make it happen. And finally, uh, I'm going to try to say a few words at the end of why I think this is an important voyage um, and what impact it had on yachting and uh, sport sailing um, in the future. So, uh, so we're going to start off by talking about the man who began the whole endeavor, and that is this guy. Thomas Gold Appleton, born in 1812. Um, Tom was a wealthy Bostonian, known mainly for being a patron of the arts and an accomplished wit. He never actually had a what we call a full-time job. Um, he did dabble in <laughs> painting poetry himself, but didn't quite achieve the success that he was hoping to. Uh, so he was uh, more of a supporter of other artists and other writers. And he was also active in all the elite social circles. circles excuse me. Uh, of Boston and other cities that he lived in. Uh, he also happened to be brother-in-law to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and Henry married Tom's sister Frances in 1843, and as a result, Tom had a very close relationship with the Longfellow family for his uh, adult life. In 1865, um, I hear music. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, so it, in 1865, Appleton decided that he wanted to build himself a new yacht. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in his 1875 memoir, which was titled a, uh, a Sheaf of Papers, he devoted an entire chapter to the yacht's construction and its subsequent voyage across the Atlantic. And he wrote, to build a home upon the deep, a cottage with a keel, or three-storied argosy for long marine flights, is the happy lot of not so many. <laughs> well, he could certainly afford that happy lot. Um, and so he decided he was going to hire someone to build his boat. The identity of the boat builder was, has been, still is a bit of a mystery uh, for a long time. All of the available sources we have identify him just by last name, Townsend. And for a long time, the most likely candidate seemed to be a James Townsend, who was a shipbuilder who had operations in both East Boston and Newburyport, Massachusetts during this period. But every statement from um, 
Appleton and the Longfellow family and other people involved with the house insist that the boat was built in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And this Jamestown's never uh, had an operation in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So after a lot of digging around, I actually found a 1970s newspaper article from the Portsmouth Herald that names a John Townsend. And it says he's actually a carpenter, not a shipbuilder. And that would explain, in large part, I think, uh, Appleton's quote in his memoir that he said he had selected a supposed marine, though rural genius, <laughs> to build the Alice. Apparently, he wanted to encourage uh, other towns instead of established shipbuilders. But otherwise, we don't know who recommended this Townsend to him or really anything else about him other than he was not uh, a recognized shipbuilder at the time. The Alice itself was a sloop. It had just one mast. We'll see lots of pictures of it shortly. Um, its sails were arranged in what's called a fore and aft rig configuration, meaning they go along the line of the keel as opposed to um, sails that are perpendicular to the keel, which are called square rig. The yacht used two sails for the most part, a main sail and a head sail, which was the one in front. And as initially built, it was 54 feet long. So we could go ahead to picture constructed. Had a beam or a width of 17 and a half feet, drew six foot, 10 inches of water, a 50 foot high mast, and a 54, look, 54 foot long boom. So its boom was as long as the boat itself. And it carried about 1,500 yards of sail. It possessed a number of unusual features for the time. At least one source noted that the boat's beam was proportionally more than the average yacht of the day. And you'll get a sense of that from a few other um, <coughs> pictures. It looks like almost a tub. <laughs> but apparently the uh, uh, Longfellows and Appleton said that that increased its stability and comfort when it was sailing. Some contemporary locals in Portsmouth who were familiar with shipbuilding themselves uh, looked upon the length of Alice's boom with suspicion noting it was, as I said, as long as the boat itself, and they believed that the ship would, quote, roll right over as soon as wind hit the sails. <laughs> the lack of confidence in the design, uh, fortunately, um, was not true, proved to be unfounded for, uh, for Appleton and the crew that sailed it across the ocean. And we have a second picture. And here you can get a good idea of that, the length of that boom is there. It's quite large, considering the size of the ship itself. The yacht was named for Appleton's niece, Alice Longfellow, who was born in 1850 and the eldest of Henry Longfellow's daughters. It's not clear why Appleton chose to name the boat after her. Uh, based on correspondence between the two of them, it appears that maybe Tom, Appleton, and Alice had a closer relationship than he did with her sisters, her younger sisters. But she was extremely pleased with the fact that the yacht bore her name, and she fervently followed all the reports of the boat's exploits in the papers, constantly wrote to her brother Charles, who sailed, who sailed on it, um, and said, I feel too much honored altogether in having such a namesake. And at one point, she also wrote that she wished she had been a boy so she could have gone on the trip. So, and there's Alice. Uh, this photo is actually dated to 1866. I think this is probably a couple years earlier. I don't think she's quite 16. Uh, but that gives you an idea of what she looked like during the period. So because he possessed a considerable fortune, uh, Tom Appleton was able to spend very lavishly on the yacht's construction. We don't have any records indicating just how much money he spent, but the cost did exceed what he thought was reasonable, because he writes, the pleasure of construction has byways and hidden places for expense, of which the happy architect is unconscious, till the sum total of his bills brings of it only a too realizing sense. <laughs> so obviously when he finally got the, uh, the numbers from the shipbuilder, I think he was a little astounded. And this spiraling cost, that issue, is one of the reasons that Appleton selects Arthur Hamilton Clark to be the captain of the Alice on this transatlantic voyage. Clark's family were Beacon Street neighbors of the Appletons, so they knew each other very well. Arthur's father, Benjamin, who was involved in the West Indian coffee trade, owned 36 Beacon Street, so it's just a few doors down from where uh, Nathan Appleton, Tom's father, had lived. Benjamin Clark was a ship owner himself. He owned one of the first yachts to ever be in Boston, and he also owned the yacht that won the first ever regatta held in Massachusetts Bay in 1845. Arthur, born in 1841, therefore grew up with a lot of exposure to uh, sailing, and as a young man, he served on various ships in the China trade, rising through ranks to become a sailing master before he became captain of the Alice for this voyage. 
Tom Appleton's decision to ask Clark to captain the boat on the trip is depicted in a 1905 magazine article as a result of an almost whim of the moment event. Uh, this article, uh, in rather flowery terms, describes Appleton running into Clark on the street in Boston and just on the spur of the moment convincing him to go up to Portsmouth with him to look at the yacht, which was then under construction. When Appleton expressed dismay at the fact that he wasn't going to be able to sail the yacht this year because he was planning travel to Europe, Clark suggested, well, why don't you just sail your yacht over yourself? <laughs> Take it with you. And Appleton said, well, it's much too large to be put on a steamship. And then, then Clark said, well, how about I sail it over for you? Mm -hmm. So Appleton says, OK, that sounds great. And engages him to be the captain for that voyage. And he chose a destination, um, the Isle of Wight, specifically the town of Cowes. And this decision is based on the fact that that is where the Royal Yacht Squadron is based, was then, still is. So it was the center of English yachting society, and it was also the scene of the famous 1851 race won by the yacht America, which began the America's Cup tradition. So if Tom wanted to really make a splash in the yachting world, he couldn't have picked a better spot to go do it. Also at Appleton's request, Clark agrees to oversee the rest of the construction process of the Alice in part to keep a lid on the cost issues. So when he assumed this role, and also that of captain, uh, this made Afton's former sailing master, the man who had sailed his previous yacht, a man named, a man named Sam Cobill, very unhappy. In fact, Cobill um, reportedly was the one who encouraged Appleton to build a new yacht. So he was in charge of the construction initially, and then I guess Tom got so unhappy about the cost that he basically fires him. Um, the rest of the crew that was engaged to sail the, the boat over were professional sailors. Here they are. Um, we have William Rolston on top. He was from Denmark. He was an accomplished sailor himself. In fact, he'd even uh, been a crew member on a blockade runner during the Civil War, actually delivering supplies to the Confederacy. Um, another member is Angus McKay from Nova Scotia, who later became a fisherman in Massachusetts. And then we have Donald McLeod, also a Nova Scotian, but unfortunately we don't know too much about him. Um, and in fact, we're not even sure which one of these is McKay and which one of these is McLeod. <laughs> we know this is Rolston because we have lots of other images of it and information on him, but I just don't know which guy is which here. Um, so Rolston throughout the cruise is really referred to as being sort of the first mate. He's obviously senior to the, the other two seamen. We do know that these two guys both lived in the same boarding house on Fleet Street in the North End of Boston in 1866. Um, if you go there now, it's just a tiny little parking lot about the size of this room, and as much as the North End is. Um, there was also a steward, or a cook, on the boat. He's responsible for pairing all the meals that would be served during the trip. He was Chinese, and depending on which source you go by, his name was either, well, his anglicized name was either John Hansen, or George Harrison. <laughs> Not the Beatle, obviously. <laughs> the Hanson name actually comes from Charlie Longfellow's own journal of the trip, and since that's a first-hand eyewitness account, I, I'm going with John Hanson. The uh, George Harrison one derives from an article written 50 years later, so I think they've been some transcription errors uh, crept in there. Tom Appleton described Hanson as a quaint Chinese steward whose face suggested remoter foreign parts than the Alice was proposed to visit. <laughs> and the final two members of the, uh, the crew were really along on more of a pleasure trip than they were uh, working sailors. And they are Charlie Longfellow. Mm -hmm. He has an 1864 looking pretty dapper, top hat and his umbrella. Charlie uh, always had an affinity for sailing and he really agitated to be uh, on the boat. Um, and luckily, uh, Tom Appleton, his uncle, uh, liked him an awful lot and was very indulgent and said, fine, not only can you come along on the ship, on the, on the trip, but you can bring a friend with you. And this is one of Charlie's very good friends, Harry Stanfield, also a Civil War veteran, as Charlie had been. Um, and both Stanfield and Charlie were early members of the New York Yacht Club as soon as they came of age, basically. Stanfield was the son of a wealthy merchant and a Cambridge resident by 1860. So they, I'll talk a little bit more later about what they actually do on the trip. 
So the voyage was uh, made in the summer of 1866, and they started making preparations in June. Supplies of all kinds were loaded onto the boat. Captain Clark gives a really good rundown of what they take with them. Uh, he records, they take two barrels of salt beef, one of pork, a large cask of water, firewood. It says the owls had a water tank holding about 60 gallons, and then another cask of water below, a barrel of pilot bread, flour, split peas, beans, rice, dried apples, tea, coffee, etc. Supposed to be sufficient to last 40 days. This is uh, one of those pictures where I said you can get a good idea of the width of the boat. And it, you know, it almost looks like a tub. Apparently made it very uh, comfortable. Um, the people in this photo here, this is Charlie right here, Longdello. This is Arthur Clark, the captain. This is William Rolston, that senior of the three hired men to crew the boat. And I figured out that this guy is actually one of Charlie's good friends, a man named Billy Fay, who comes down to see them launch on their way to England. So he doesn't actually go on the trip, but he got, he got his picture on the boat. <laughs> and you can also see some of the other features. You can see the binnacle. This would have been where the ship's compass was kept. Um, and Rolston actually has his hand on the tiller right there. So the, the boat did not have a wheel in it. Charlie Longfellow also recorded what the yacht was loaded with, writing, the whole cabin is filled up level with, ta with a table with barrels of beef, pork, bread, etc., and water. The bunks are full of provisions, canned meats, firewood. We have nothing that is fancy as curtains or the like to be seen. We do have a photograph of at least part of the interior, and here we in fact do see some curtains. <laughs> this photo is actually taken in England after they've gotten there, and presumably have consumed uh, many of the supplies that Charlie says were piled up all to the left of the bunk. Um, this is Charlie again right here. This is Arthur Clark checking out some charts. And this is Harry Stanfield reclining in his bunk right there. Clark had his own room as captain of the ship. And there was a galley where a steward would prepare meals. And then the rest of the crew probably shared uh, the same sleeping space. Unfortunately, we don't have a diagram of the cabin's layout. Charlie gives a good description of his accommodations. He says, Harry and I have our stateroom looking quite cozy. I have two pictures of the dear ones on the wall and the family stuck in the looking glass. And the, ba and the cherry basket full of books in the wash basin, <clears throat> that being a superfluous arrangement on board this packet, a tumbler full of water a day answering all purposes of the toilet. Harry has a cigar box tastefully arranged on the wall of his room as a bookshelf. The large pipe also adorns the wall besides a small looking glass and a watch fob. By request, I shall not describe the captain's room as his Bible is not yet hung up. <laughs> um, in addition to food and water, they put extra supplies for the yacht itself, for the, the boat. Uh, Clark writes that the Alice had iron ballast molded to her floors and all stowed inside. We had a storm trysail made and a square sail shaped and set like a top mast studding sail. That's so what I was talking about, the wide array of sails. I'm not even sure what each one of these would look like. Uh, a canvas sea anchor, a cone about five feet long. This was all in the way of extra canvas except two bolts of sailcloth, one medium and one light for repairing sails, etc. Spare blocks, coils of rattling stuff, and two coils of manila rope. Um, apart from just stocking the ship for the trip, they made very few changes uh, to its uh, arrangement of sails, which is one of the unusual things about this trip. Essentially, it crosses the ocean under its racing rig, which was something that had not been done before. Uh, apparently, most ships would have, for an ocean-going trip, they'd change the arrangement of the sails for various reasons, but uh, Clark decided that essentially they were going to try to race across the ocean and set a time record. Um, <clears throat> And up to this point, again, not only the rigging, but the Alice would be the smallest uh, yacht to sail across the Atlantic. Um, oddly enough, a little aside, it seems that uh, Charlie's father, Henry Longfellow, the poet, believed that the trip was supposed to be a confidential affair. Um, not sure why, but in a letter to his uh, younger son, Ernest, he wrote, Now I am going to tell you a secret which must not be mentioned out of the family, nor in any of your letters. <laughs> You're putting it in a letter. <laughs> Uncle Tom's new yacht, the Alice, is launched and getting ready for sea. When ready, she is to sail for England with Arthur Clark as captain and Charlie as passenger. 
This will be about the 1st of July, so that when you reach England, you will probably find them still in one of the southern harbors. Um, despite Henry's impression that the trip was supposed to be kept under wraps, uh, when the Owls finally sent off from Nahant on July 11, 1866, the entire town came out. So, I'm not sure why. In fact, the idea of sending the yacht across the ocean had been raised well beforehand by Tom Appleton, who wrote uh, that in regard to the venture, there were, quote, many hands upheld in warning, many solemn words of discouragement. So there were people telling them, it's a bad idea, you really shouldn't be going out the ocean. Yacht that's just that big. So he was spreading it around. He was talking to people about it. Um, a magazine article published about 40 years after the event even says that uh, Appleton announced that they were going to do this at a dinner party at his home in Boston. Uh, so he definitely wanted people to know. <clears throat> in fact, the night before the trip uh, began, Henry Longfellow gave a dinner at their house in the Haunt honoring Captain Clark, his son, Harry Stanfield, and others. Uh, surprisingly, Tom Appleton was not present at this dinner. In fact, he doesn't make the trip on the Alice. He left earlier on a steamer to go to England because of what he refers to as a domestic calamity, but we don't know what it is. Uh, so he's not actually on the boat, but I think another reason that he didn't go on the trip is probably because he was uh, an older man, very wealthy, used to being uh, in comfort, and while the ship was very nicely appointed, being on the high seas for almost three weeks in tight quarters with a lot of younger men is probably not to his liking. So, uh, so he took a steamer across. So crowds of people on the porches and even the roofs of the cottages in the haunt gathered to watch the Alice start off. Um, in fact, when the Alice had left the shipyard in Boston where it had been getting all these extra sails and ballast put on, even that had been a bit of a event Tom Appleton had written of, of that launch, which was just going from Boston to Nahant very short, um, that all the town was by and many friends were there to witness the launch. So they were both big events. And again, not a secret, so I really want to find out why Henry thought it was a secret. We don't know yet. So when they did leave from Nahant, they were escorted um, some way out by a lot of the other boats that were in port there. And it was at this point that uh, one of the uh, more humorous things happens. They discover that the Longfellow family dog, a terrier named Trap, <laughs> stowed away on the boat <laughs> and had remained unnoticed until they were well offshore. Um, there's Trap and the terrier, and Henry. Um, the Longfellows had numerous dogs, and Henry said of Trap that he was the best one. Uh, Captain Clark later recalled in his uh, um, memory that. There was some confusion as what are they going to do with the stowaway? No one wanted to have the dog on board. Uh, it was, again, a small yacht. You don't want this animal underfoot. And then there was also the danger that it might go overboard. But returning to Nahant was not really something they wanted to do either. They had already set out. And Clark wrote, the breeze was freshening. No one wished to return. We were at sea and meant to stay there until we landed at cows. But by a stroke of good luck, they spotted a nearby schooner loaded with firewood coming into shore. And they pulled alongside and talked to the captain, and he agreed to take the dog back to Nahant and return to Henry. And we have, this is actually a calling card, one of Harry Stanfield's calling cards. Uh, and on the other side, Charlie wrote, please pay bearer of trap five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently the captain did bring the dog back to Henry and, and was uh, compensated for his trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so with all the ceremonies sent off complete and the dog issue finally resolved, uh, the crew finally got down to the serious business of sailing in the open ocean. Almost right away after their departure, they found themselves involved in an impromptu race against another sloop named Narragansett. But Alice proved itself to be a faster boat, and after a 10 mile or so run, Narragansett gave up the chase, and Alice took off. <coughs> first, they also saw their first problem with the <coughs> um, The builder Townsend comes in for um, some harsh language as a result of some of his innovations as, during the trip. Charlie records that they discovered a leak and he, he wrote that he blamed it on Townsend's fancy pipes. You know, I don't know what the function of these pipes was because he's not any clearer than that, but in any case it was soon fixed. By the end of the next day, Alice had already covered over 250 miles and passed by Cape Sable at the southern tip of Nova Scotia. 
Clark recorded, at four o'clock, the low headland of Cape Sable is seen shrouded in mist, tall white lighthouse, peering like a ghost through the fog. This is the lighthouse that they would have seen. Um, it had been built only five years earlier because that stretch of coastline had seen a lot of wrecks, including one in 1861, 1860, sorry, the SS Hungarian that actually sank within sight of shore, but because of the rough conditions, all 25 people were lost and the people on shore couldn't get out safely. There is still a lighthouse there, a newer, much taller one, but this is the original one. It was only 65 feet tall. There. It's also about, at this point in the trip, early on, where we get a good idea of just what role Charlie and his friend Harry Stanfield are playing. Uh, clues had already been given, such as in uh, Clark's account of the trip, in which he makes the distinction between Longfellow and Stanfield as passengers, as opposed to the other three crewmen that we saw before. And Longfellow's own journal indicates that although he and Harry were, were not considered part of the crew, they did pitch in and do things at times. One of the duties that Charlie and Harry take over was to share a watch with one of the three crewmen, so they had a rotating watch. Um, as you see, this is the benefit of, of being the wealthy son of, or nephew of the boat's owner. Um, instead of standing a full watch, essentially they're each taking uh, one third of a watch and swapping with one of the sailors each time around. So they're standing on watch for <clears throat> only four hours at a time. Charlie recorded, Harry and I take turns with the third man, which is very easy on us. There's no indication in Charlie's journal that he does much of the actual work of sailing. Uh, he and Harry were certainly not ignorant of how to hand handle boats. Uh, they sailed quite a bit. Uh, they had a lot of experience with small craft in coastal waters, but being out on the ocean for an extended voyage like this was something different altogether. And it's pretty clear that Clark wanted experienced sailors to be the actual crew and do the work. Charlie did at times try his hand at some navigation and determining their position, calculating longitude and latitude. Uh, three days into the trip, he wrote, I have been doing some heavy arithmetic today to prove to Arthur the importance of working up his latitude more. Uh, Clark is really silent on what he thought of Longfellow's advice. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably, uh, okay, I, I got it under control. Uh, what Charlie and Harry did do was a lot of reading, writing, their journals, sketching, and writing letters. Another favorite activity was apparently making fun of the steward, especially by repeatedly insinuating that some of the food he served up was at least partly composed of the dog. <laughs> For some reason, they seemed to think this was really funny. No doubt they considered it good-natured ribbing, but there is a little hint of racism to it, which is not surprising considering the period and the relationship of Charlie and Harry being wealthy uh, young men, wealthy white young men, to a Chinese immigrant. Harry Sandfield even wrote that uh, he had nicknamed the steward Chop Chop Pickle, which is really offensive to today, but they just thought it was fun. Uh, despite the treatment, it's clear from all the accounts, though, that they thought very highly of him. Clark recalling that Hanson was a jewel in his department, and about halfway through the trip, uh, Charlie writes of him, the precious steward produced a magnificent tapioca pudding today. He astonishes us every day or two by some new talent, and when we get him to the Isle of Wight, they expect the Queen will request him as a particular favor to get up a swell dinner for her and the Emperor of France. <laughs> um, luckily for them, the weather cooperated during the trip for the most part. In fact, uh, they seem to be most unhappy on the two days of calm wind when they don't make much progress. But generally, the Isle sped right along, often covering over 200 miles in a day. Um, as I said, most fortunate was the general lack of bad weather. Uh, Charlie did write, from my log, the home delegation may think we have had no bad weather, nor have we had anything really nasty, but there have been four or five days when no yacht in Massachusetts Bay would have ventured out. So they had, they had some rough weather, but, but no big storms. And here we have a great photo. Um, I like this because it's actually an action shot. You can see the, the foam there. This photo actually is not in our collection. Almost every other image I'm showing you is. This is from MIT's Heart Nautical Collection. Um, they had a great visit over there. And, uh, and it's a little bit later, 1870, but it is the same boat, and we know that for sure because you can see Tom Appleton's personal signal flag right there, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And this also gives you a good idea of how the lifeboats were actually attached to the boat when it was out to sea. Um, Alice performed admirably during the crossing and receives high praise from both Clark and Longfellow. At one point, Clark wrote, 
I am more than pleased with the both performance. More in love with her than any inanimate thing on earth. <laughs> so, seriously, in love with the boat. Charlie wrote, she is the most perfect boat to steer I ever saw, almost doing it herself, and so easy in a seaway, infinitely ahead of any vessel I ever was in before. They did have a few other small problems. Uh, one occurred on July 20th, so they're nine days out. A uh, halyard block, and for anybody who doesn't know this, it's essentially like a pulley arrangement to help bring some lower sails. Uh, so the halyard block separates from its attachment to the mast, causing a uh, sail yard to crash down onto the deck. And while they quickly fixed the problem, in doing so they discovered that there was another iron band around the mast by which several other key pieces of tackle were attached, and it was in danger of falling apart entirely. Uh, the severity of the problem was indicated by Clark's passage when he wrote, This is the sorrow's crown of sorrow, the very soul and body lashing of the whole fabric. The bursting of a three-eighths inch thick band of iron in the boat would be a wreck. Uh, Charlie's account gives a good uh, idea of what Clark probably actually said when he <laughs> discovered the potentially crippling flaw in the boat's construction. Uh, Charlie wrote, Townsend, the builder, ought to have been here to hear the compliments bestowed on him by the captain for having put such a miserable thing into it. <laughs> the builder comes in for another round of condemnation in Charlie's journal six days later, <clears throat> Charlie records, this morning carried away the gooseneck, but soon had the boom secure with a chain to the life rail. The gooseneck was the meanest piece of ironwork I ever saw, thanks to Mr. Townsend. <laughs> the gooseneck is a big swivel that attaches the boom to the mast. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty important piece. We have another image. This is actually just a sketch of gals done by Ernest Longfellow, Charlie's younger brother. And again, you can see Tom Appleton's personal flag right there. There's another banner. It actually says Alice. Uh, one of the crew's favorite things to do during the journey was to see just how quickly they could catch, pass, and leave behind other ships that they encountered going in the same direction as they were. Speed was the all-important thing, and the more they felt that they had the opportunity to test what Alice could do and how she handled, the better they would be able to compete against the English yachts they expected to challenge when they got to the Isle of Wight. Alice did prove itself to be a very fast boat, overtaking almost every other ship they encountered, except for one, which was a large East India trader, which they apparently didn't really expect to be faster than. There's repeated mention made of the astonishment of other ship captains and passengers at the sight of the little Alice, that far out to sea, especially bearing down on them, passing them. <laughs> one account, uh, Charlie records, says that they came up to and hailed a bark, that's another type of ship, Standing in the same way that we were, he seemed surprised at our sailing so fast and mentioned it. So they'd actually shout across to other boats as they were going across. Uh, Clark recorded a similar reaction from the captain of another ship, writing that he expressed astonishment at our quick run. This is my favorite image of the boat we have in our collection. Uh, this is a painting done by John Eric Christian Peterson. He was a Danish painter, came to the United States opened a studio in Boston in 1864. He became friendly with both Henry Longfellow and Tom Atherton, spent a lot of time with them at Nahant at their cottage, and he often sailed in the Alice. They even let him take it out to uh, regattas and yacht races at places like Marblehead. And uh, some art experts believe that he would have been right up there with uh, Buttersworth, as the premier uh, painter of marine scenes, had he not died so young. So by July 29th, uh, the Alice finally reaches the English Channel. And the next day they spy land for the first time since they had passed that southern tip of Nova Scotia in that lighthouse. At 11 p.m. on July 31st, they spot the landmark that marks the end of the initial transatlantic journey, which was a series of chalk formations off the west end of the Isle of Wight known as the Needles. Clark calculated the time it had taken to cross the ocean, and he marked down 19 days, 8 hours, and 20 minutes a distance of approximately 3,000 nautical miles. But due to the fact that they showed up late at night, they decided to stay out to sea because they really wanted to make a grand entrance the next day so they could see them. And Clark gets a good count of that. <coughs> he wrote, at uh, 6.30 in the morning, you come booming along down through the fleet of yachts, about 40 of number, and receive their salutes. The dear old flag, never looking more proud. We answer with our booming gun when the anchor is let go, her white wings nestled about her, and the story is ended. So the journey across the ocean might have ended, but Alice's arrival in Cows is just the beginning of 
of about two months of yachting around the English Channel, participating in races. Um, they also visit the homes of some prominent figures and authors like uh, um, Victor Hugo on uh, his Jersey Island. And they attend a lot of events as well. First here is a, <clears throat> an image of cows. Uh, this is actually from a piece of stationery that Charlie was writing a letter to his sister Alice. See, August 12, 1866. And in it, you can actually see the clubhouse of the Royal Yacht Squadron, which is right there. <clears throat> One of the first things that Clark and Longfellow do after they get ashore is to send a telegram to Tom Appleton, who was um, in London, informing them of their arrival in England. Tom himself is caught off guard by the speed with which the trip had been completed. <coughs> After hearing of their presence in England, he responds with a telegram of his own saying, you came too quick. <laughs> I can't come for three more days. Um, also, Charlie sends a telegram home to his father through the transatlantic cable that had been completed less than a week earlier. <laughs> um, and he writes that he did it as a lark. He wrote, the female operator was much pleased as it was the first message she had sent from her office being only 20 pounds sterling a message. Anybody have a guess as to how much money that's the equivalent of today? To send a telegram, $2,000. Oh $2,000 to send a message as a lark. They had money. <laughs> About a week after their arrival, an invitation is extended by the Royal, the Royal Yacht Squadron to Tom, uh, Arthur Clark, Longfellow and Stanfield to attend its annual dinner event, their big sort of uh, uh, social event of the year. Um, you know who's not invited? <laughs> Kay, Cloud, Rolston, the guys who actually did the work. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a very class conscious event. Uh, in attendance were many members of the British nobility. Appleton uh, was the honored guest of the evening as the owner of the Alice and was uh, induced to give a speech, which he wasn't expecting, but after he gets advice from uh, one of the Brits there to drink a lot of wine. <laughs> You'll be fine, just drink this. And, and apparently he did, and they said everybody loved his speech, but he didn't really remember what he said. <laughs> but he was humble enough to say in his memoir, I had little diffidence in hearing compliments to the Alice for her ocean voyage, as I had no hand in it. So at least he's Actually, here is a photo. Well, this is a photo of a painting, actually, of the clubhouse again. And they actually had the dinner right out in front here. Tom Appleton wrote that it took place on the semicircular terrace, which had been enclosed with bunting for the occasion. So it's pretty clearly where they were sitting during that dinner. So for about the next two months, Alice and his crew sails in the English Channel, um, visiting ports in England, France, and the Channel Islands, and participating in a lot of races, both formal and casual. Um, the crew had been very unhappy, though, because when they arrived, they had the uh, official from the Royal Yacht Squadron assess the boat to determine what class of boat it was, or the size, and who it should be racing against. And they got a measurement of 56 tons assigned, whereas their own assessment had been half that, at 28 tons. Now, this might have been the result of differences in US and British methods of measurement, weight, assessment, uh, and also possibly British unfamiliarity with Alice's construction. They had constant visitors coming to the boat, the boat and um, commenting on the width of its beam, and they, they were astounded that for such a relatively small yacht, how well appointed the cabins were, how spacious it seemed. So anyway, so they don't like this, this assessment, um, and they decide to do something else. Clark says, I don't think we can beat any boat that we're put up against based on the weight that they gave us. So instead, Tom Appleton puts up a silver cup worth $1,000 as the prize for any boat of similar length that can beat the Alice in a race around the Isle of Wight. Mm -hmm. They get no takers, <laughs> not, not one. Um, some weeks later, when they're across the channel in Dieppe, France, uh, Alice actually does get a challenge from her British yacht called Achiever for a different race, not for this $1,000 prize. It's actually the local regatta at Dieppe. And despite the fact that Alice leads early on in the race, uh, they lose, apparently according to an error by the French pilot they had taken on board to help guide them through the, 
familiar race course. Uh, Longfellow was so angry with the error, causing them to lose, he wrote, the wretched pilot I expect was glad enough to get ashore with a whole skin, as we vented our wrath on him as well as we could in French, and it was difficult to restrain Harry from pitching into and pounding him, which he richly deserved. And here is Charlie's journal showing the course of that particular race. And they start here, and Alice pulls ahead. They go around this marker here, and then this is the path the Alice takes, and they get to this point whereupon the pilot realized they were supposed to go here. Whereas the British yacht, Achiever, takes the right course, and Charlie writes that by the time they correct their course and get around the marker, Achiever is too far ahead that even though they gain on her, they can't. They can't catch up. The, race. Um, the mayor of Dieppe had actually uh, had a medal made that they really apparently wanted to pre uh, present to uh, the Alice and his crew, but the Achiever ends up with it. And in fact, they encounter each other, Achiever and Alice, later on. And basically, the, the owner of the Achiever is kind of rubbing at their face, saying, But I got it. You didn't get it. <laughs> uh, so Charlie and Harry and Clark are really curious about this. Um, near the end of the trip, they made sure to have lots of photographs taken um, of the crew, some with Tom Appleton in them, some without. Here's one. <coughs> so we have, again, either McKay or McLeod on the ends. <laughs> Rolls in there. There's Tom Appleton. Um, Tom is also not on the yacht for much of their cruise through the channel. Uh, he spends most of that time actually in Paris, which was possibly his favorite place in the world. He's the one who was credited with uh, coming up with the, the, the quip that all good Americans die. When they die, they go to Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, Clark right there, the captain, his spyglass, Charlie over here, uh, Harry, and then Hanson, the steward. And then we have another one without, without Tom in it. Um, this is interesting because you see that the crewmen are all wearing a uniform. Tom Appleton had those uniforms made after they arrived in England. You look really closely, it's tough to see. It actually says Alice on the band of the hat there. Um, we unfortunately have no uh, letters or journals from any of those three men, uh, but I'm wondering what they thought about the uniforms. And, uh, they were getting paid, so I figured they were probably going to wear them, but they may not have been happy having to get dressed up. On October 3rd, Charlie records in his journal, um, great dismay at the news that Tom has decided not to allow Arthur Clark or Charlie to sail back home on the Alice. Tom, citing his constant state of worry during the crossing and even in the channel excursions, says that he had already promised Henry Longfellow that he wouldn't let Charlie <laughs> sail back. Um, and I think Tom knew what the reaction was going to be because he delivers this news by way of a letter when he is away. So he doesn't have to get in an argument with Clark and Longfellow. Charlie wrote that he and Clark, quote, felt pretty nasty, end quote, about the decision. And he also wrote, I don't think I ever felt so badly about a little thing in my life. But on a slightly lighter note, we have this in our collection. This is, I don't know what the original image is supposed to be depicted, but, uh, Charlie, this is his writing on the bottom. Obviously, he picked up this little carte de visite. It's pretty small. And wrote on it, Harry, so he's talking about his friend Harry, as he appeared on hearing the cruise was nearly over. <laughs> so they were all very sad to have it end. <laughs> Tom Appleton determined that Alice would remain in England for the winter instead of being sailed back, um, which was probably a wise decision. See what time of year it is. You don't really want to be in the North Atlantic uh, in, a, in a small yacht. In hurricane season. So he had the ship hauled out at a shipyard called Ratsy's in Cows, or nearby. Uh, this is a photo from uh, Longfellow's album. It's a shipyard, it says Isle of Wight. We don't know if it's the actual one where the ship was taken out, but it gives you a good idea of what they would have done. There would have been a ramp, and then they pull the boat up out of the water and keep it out of there for the winter. Uh, one member of the crew, Rolston, was selected to stay in England with the boat to oversee its repair and outfitting, and then sail it back to Massachusetts the next spring. Um, this seems to have uh, worked out pretty well for Rolston because 
During that time, he meets and marries an English girl. The register office in Newport on the Isle of Wight records the marriage of a William Rolston to Jane Lovett in 1866. So that means within a space of three months, he met and married this woman. Like that. Uh, and we actually have a photo of him and his wife. Uh, so here she is, Jane Lovett. This was taken in May 1867, just before he comes back. Uh, apparently, he takes her with him on the house to sail back. And then he just sort of disappears. I don't know what happened. But the trip back apparently took 34 days instead of 19. So wind conditions and, and other things just weren't, and they weren't trying to set a speed record on the way back either. So uh, after the ship is pulled out and put in the shipyard, uh, Arthur Clark and Tom Appleton returned to the US by uh, steamship. Charlie Longfellow and Harry Stanfield go to Paris. And then Longfellow meets another Appleton uncle, Nathan Jr., there, and eventually sets off on a trip to Russia with him. Crewman Angus McKay returns to the United States, uh, settled in Provincetown, Cape Cod, where he died in 1922 after a long career as a fisherman and ship owner and a prominent member of the community. Um, his house actually still exists. It, it was damaged by fire in the 80s, I think, but they rebuilt it on Commercial Street, the main drag in Provincetown. And I think it's now a t-shirt shop. But <laughs> well, but it's still there in some part. When they did rebuild it, they rebuilt it in the same style as it had been before it burned. Uh, unfortunately, as I said before, we, don't, we just don't know what happens to John Hansen, the steward, or the other crewmen that fell on the cloud. Uh, there are no records. They may have left, gone to another part of the country, who knows. So what impact did this voyage have? Uh, well, a 1901 article in a magazine called The Rudder, a, a yachting magazine, stated that the trip contributed materially to stimulating the idea of the first yacht race across the Atlantic. So the first yacht race across the Atlantic took place between three yachts, all owned by extremely wealthy New Yorkers, and it went from New York to La Havre, France, in December of 1866. So pretty soon after this voyage was made, uh, one of those yachts in that race was the Henrietta, owned by James Gordon Bennett, Jr., Victoria's owner of the New York Herald, uh, famous for other things like sponsoring uh, uh, family to go find Livingston, which he just did to generate paper sales, and just basically for his behavior in New York, too. He was a, a notorious misbehavior. He used to ride his carriage around naked uh, on the streets of New York, uh, totally drunk as well. Um, but. Bennett and Longfellow were very good friends. Uh, so I'm sure Bennett would have heard of this voyage, he would have read about it in the papers, and I'm sure said to himself, that's pretty cool, I have a much bigger yacht. <laughs> I think I'd like to do this. And, and, uh, and so three men, and he's one of them, each put down $30,000 a piece in 1866. Wow. So it's a $90,000 purse for the first one to win. And they take off in this race in December, and conditions are terrible. And one of the ships loses several crewmen overboard, and they die. Uh, all for the, the vanity of these wildly wealthy uh, you know, New Yorkers. But, uh, but it is the first transatlantic race. That 1901 article also claimed that when Clark got back to the US, he was much in demand by yacht owners who saw his opinions on transoceanic yachting. Um, apparently, even Bennett is maybe uh, approached Clark to captain his boat on that race that happened in December, but he declined the offer and returned to the Far East to captain cargo and passenger ships, and then later in life became very well known as an authority on yachting and yachting history. Um, Alice's voyage was deemed a very newsworthy event on both sides of the ocean at the time. Papers in the US and England reported the success of the crossing, as well as details of the cruise in the English Channel. Stories about the Alice's trip appeared in such varied American newspapers as the New York Times, the New South newspaper in Beaufort, South Carolina, and the weekly Arkansas Gazette in Little Rock. <laughs> Not a yachting hotbed, but they're reporting on it. <laughs> it even makes newspapers in Australia. So it was a big deal at the time. Um, ultimately, what becomes of the Alice itself? Uh, it never again took part in a voyage like the one in 1866, but it was used for many years by the family for pleasure cruising along the New England coast. Oh. This is another painting of the Alice by Peterson, that same artist who did the bigger one. Um, 
I like this one. You can't see it here, but if you had a magnifying glass, you can tell that some of the people on the back are actually women in dresses. Um, so this is definitely a, a pleasure cruise going on here. And actually, this painting, which is in our collection, had been misdated to a date that predated Alice's construction, so we didn't actually know it was Alice. So I took another look at it and then found Tom Appleton's flag again in the magnifying glass. It's definitely Tom's flag, and you can tell it's by the lines of the boat and the cabin, and even the, window, the uh, skylight on top of the cabin. It's definitely the Alice. So we have two. This one was done actually in 1867. So trips along the coast of Maine and races off in the haunt were some of the most common outings recorded in various Longfellow family journals. Uh, and both Tom and Charlie joined the Eastern Yacht Club in Marblehead, Mass. This is a pin with the name of the Alice right there. In, in reality, this is this big, very small. And this is the burgee or flag of the Eastern Yacht Club. Uh, Tom Appleton was actually one of the club's founders in 1870. And then in 1871, Tom actually has the boat modified. He has it lengthened by 12 and a half feet to improve her speed. And in 1874, Arthur Clark is on the Alice again for a cruise in Maine. And he says he thinks so highly of the modifications that he wants to sail her across the ocean again. But it just never happens. Here you say, you can see in this, this one, uh, you've got the same cabin, same deck of the boat, but now it's got a much more angular appearance got this little, it's not quite a figurehead, but decorative piece under the bowsprit right there. And they've changed the sails a little bit. They've got a top sail now. <clears throat> and then you also have a picture of Tom's signal flag. Uh, this actually comes from the register at the Eastern Yacht Club, where I was lucky enough to visit. And this is a book about this thick um, that has the personal signal flags of every single member. And Tom's is right up there in the front of the book, page one. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have the original flag at the Eastern Yacht Club <coughs> on a wall framed in one of their hallways and displayed there. The flag itself had been made by Alice Longfellow. Uh, it's in pretty rough shape, as you can imagine it would have been after a transatlantic crossing. It's lost at the uh, tails now. Uh, it's really faded, but it is. Uh, Definitely the one that was made by Alice. It's annotated, and Arthur Clark has a, a handwritten note in the frame that says that it had been made by Alice, given to him by Tom after the trip across the ocean, and then he had presented it to the young club. So when Appleton dies in 1884, in his will it says, I give my nephew Charles A. Longfellow all my fishing rods and guns, also my yacht Alice, They're still owned by me at my decease. So it said he was an indulgent uncle. Nephew and Yacht. <laughs> uh, Charlie keeps Alice for the next four years, using it much as his uncle did, taking friends and family members on pleasure cruises off the New England coast. But then in 1888, he acquires a new boat named the Alga. Uh, the last mention of the Alice that I've been able, able to find is uh, a 1905 newspaper article that just states, so far as known, she is still afloat on the main coast. And there was another reference that seems to indicate she was now a working boat transporting lumber. So what do we have left today? Um, the photograph, the drawings, the paintings, mentions of it in journals and letters, and we have one piece of the boat itself. This is the tiller. And this you can actually see in the Longfellow house if you come on the tour. It is uh, attached to a wall above a window in a second floor bedroom. As you can see it was carved very nicely in the shape of an eagle's head. Um, so you, you can imagine why the, the boat costs so much if you're going down to details like this in the pillar. Um, so um, it was a small boat, but I think uh, it had an outsized impact, obviously, from the newspaper reports of the day. And it seems pretty clear there's a connection between the Alice's voyage and to have a trans-oceanic race, um, it had a really outsized impact on, uh, on yachting, the history of yachting, and trans-oceanic racing is still very much a big thing, but uh, I think this little Longfellow family boat uh, had a big part in starting it all. Uh, yes.
questions, so I'm happy to try to. Yeah? Dave, you, you mentioned that they had considerable problems sailing from that cruise. Did they take it out on any shakedown cruise? Did they try it out? There was one race that they took out before, uh, but the week before they left, um, just off of Marblehead, um, and they actually lost it. <laughs> um, but beyond that, other than sailing from Portsmouth to Boston and then Boston to Nahant, just that one race. So that was basically the main, basically Pretty much, yeah. Page, yeah. 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 Yes? Early on you mentioned ballast, I think, was welded to the... Molded was the term. Um, so they were using basically chunks of lead to help stabilize the ship, especially in, in rough conditions to keep it from rocking so much. So. Weights, I've never heard of it being welded or whatever you're... Molded was the molded. term they used, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes? Was that yacht design ever copied? Apparently not. No, I haven't encountered any other um, uh, evidence that Townsend, this Townsend, ever <laughs> built another boat. So, um, there does seem to be uh, some evidence that the style of English yachts was affected by American styles and the Annals a little bit. They didn't adopt the uh, same style altogether because they had different sailing conditions and, and different methods, but it does seem to have uh, helped cross-pollinate sort of yacht design between England and the United States, but, but I haven't seen another boat that was quite the same. Yeah? When the family would go on a yachting cruise, mm -hmm. would they have a crew that really sailed the boat? And then they just stayed on the boat, or was it just the daytime? Or yeah, I don't see um, how the women the Victorian skirts and the boat. They don't really say for sure. Um, when they take these cruises up and down, especially off the coast of Maine, they're never going too far offshore. And the implication is that um, Charlie is often captaining the boat himself on these cruises. Uh, they said Tom had had a man, a man named Sam Coble, that he essentially fired. Uh, sail the boat for him, so there may have been someone they employed to do that. Um, I suspect there probably was at least one or two, but they never give any other information about who these people are. Yeah? Any time in your readings you come across a problem where they, somebody said, my God, we've got a massive amount of sail on a very small boat, did they reef it? Did they pull down the mainsail at any points and just sail they on do, the yeah, ship? When the wind kicks up at some points on that at the journey across the ocean, yeah, they, they do, and they had a smaller storm sail that they put up. And the storm sail took the place of the mainsail, or? Yes, yeah, they said it was a smaller triangular storm sail. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that Alice actually got to be on the boat? She the did, sail? yes, she did. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, she took quite a few trips on it, actually, but when this cross-ocean one happened, can tell from the letters. She's writing a lot of letters to Charlie and Tom. And she's just following every single article that she can get her hands on about it. And like I already mentioned, the one where she says she wishes she were a boy. Uh, but she, she expresses that uh, in many ways that she just is so jealous of the fact that they got to sail across the ocean. She got to stay home, so. But she did get to go on quite a bit. Yeah. You mentioned firewood. Where did they, they stole topside? They opened the deck or what? They don't say. Yeah. We got the firewood for cooking, presumably, but um, but they never mentioned where it is. Did you say the boat is around still somewhere? I doubt it very much. Yeah, I'm sure by now it would have rotted out and been scrapped. Yeah. Uh, does Alan Captain get any sort of prestige for this voyage? He did, yeah. Um, this really gets his name out there, as, as I said, uh, when he comes back. Um, Many yacht owners consult with him um, on you know, what he thinks they should do because they want to get into yacht racing. And, you know, what was your experience? And yet he becomes uh, known as an authority on yachting. So he does get quite a bit of uh, recognition from it. Did you find that Tom was on the yacht at all? Not very much. No, <laughs> uh, he was on it, but it seems like most of the time he was giving it to Charlie, or letting that artist Peterson take it out. Yeah. I don't think he spent nearly as much time to justify the expense. <laughs> one of those on it, yep, we have a, a, he's quite the yeah, we, in fact, just today I was looking, we have a, a really nice 1876 sketchbook that says, 
of, of Wadi's drawings of scenes in Maine, and they all say, from the Yacht Alice, from the Yacht Alice. So, there's even some nice pictures of uh, uh, portraits of people, and one of them is obviously Charlie, with a straw over her head. Is there any record of, of their reaction when they uh, discovered that the dog wasn't there? I mean, Henry, do we have any? From the other end of it? From, yeah. No. Um, well, we do know that on at least one other occasion, Trap ran away, so they probably just thought he's in the backyard somewhere and somebody will bring him home. Um, so now we don't know the other side. That's the story. Yeah, I, I wish Henry had recorded in his journal when the guy showed up at his door with his dog. <laughs> it was on the boat. <laughs> Did the coverage, uh, the news coverage, talk about the Longfellow or the Appleton connection, or was it all about uh, Captain Clark? Um, yeah, Charlie is mentioned in almost every article, <coughs> um, and Appleton. Yeah. In fact, maybe even more so than Arthur Clark, mm -hmm. because you know, everybody knew the name Longfellow. Um, yeah, even those articles in Australia and Arkansas. On board the boat was Charles Longfellow, son of the poet. Thanks so much for coming.